Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. So much of our lives have been affected by COVID. Stress, isolation, and limited access to resources are fueling rising rates of substance abuse and overdoses during the pandemic. While the coronavirus pandemic has been the focus of so much of our uh, thought and uh, media this year, the opioid crisis has continued unabated and even worsening. Uh, here to discuss this with us today is an expert from Mayo Clinic, Dr. Tyler Osterley, who is a, a psychiatric addiction expert, and he's going to uh, share with us about opioid use disorders and uh, treatment. Thanks for being here today, Dr. Osterley. Of course. Thank you for having me. Well, of course, I am very passionate about this topic. I have worked from another angle on the opioid crisis at Mayo Clinic for, for many years. And uh, so I've appreciated the partnership that you and I have shared as colleagues in this regard. And I'm so excited to chat with you about this today. I'm excited as well. It's, um, it's been great to work on this with you and, and um, great to be able to brainstorm with a lot of the experts here. So on. Tyler, would you start for our uh, listeners by explaining what is opioid use disorder and how do you identify it? Sure. So opioid use disorder is identified clinically through 11 symptoms that we've uh, discovered over the course of decades in, in researching this illness. Um, these symptoms have a pretty broad range, but they um, uh, can be symptoms of uh, social impairment, behavioral impairments, and, and then some physical uh, impairment as well. Because the illness affects lots of areas of the brain, um, there's a lot of different symptoms that can occur. When you think about opioid use disorder, what would, um, how would our, you define that for one of our listeners? What, um, yeah, so it, just to give a little bit more detail there, the, um, so it's, it's the overuse or the uncontrolled use of an addictive substance. So these addictive substances go into areas of the brain that, uh, that affect um, executive functioning, judgment, emotions, value setting. And because they can affect these areas of the brain, they, um, it morphs the brain around these addictive substances and gets individuals to use them in an uncontrolled sort of way uh, to the point where they uh, prioritize these substances over everything else in their lives. Um, and then they uh, can use them to uh, a degree that can lead to significant self-harm, including overdose and, and death. You and I are using the term uh, a use disorder instead of addiction. What is the difference? A use disorder, uh, we've, um, as a medical community, really moved towards that term uh, because it really puts it in the context of uh, understanding that this is uh, overuse of a substance. Addiction in the past has had a connotation of, of uh, negativity and, and shame associated with it. And so we've tried to use a more clinical term to help folks understand that really this is a clinical illness. There's treatment for it um, and uh, there's, there's help associated with it. And there's a lot of understanding associated with it from a medical standpoint. I like what you said about the, uh, the negative stigma of the use addiction, because many times I've talked to patients in the pain clinic. Of course, I manage uh, many patients who are using opioids uh, for management of their chronic pain. And um, the, the discussion about the risk of addiction, I think uh, many people think that they could not have a, a concern for addiction, which is sort of a, seen as a negative pattern of behaviors. But the fact that they could, um, you know, become reliant on this, uh, on these medications in a way that would cause them to behave negatively uh, is a little easier to swallow. Uh, I agree. It changes uh, kind of the perspective on it and, and, and really is a better descriptor of what we know is happening chemically in the brain. Tyler, I'm sure that um, many of our listeners may either know someone or have a relative uh, or certainly have read about it in the lay press about uh, patients who suffer from opioid use disorder. But how would they identify that this could be a concern for someone uh, that they love or care for? Yeah, so sometimes it's very obvious, right? So uh, if a loved one is using heroin off the street and uh, having a lot of trouble with the law, uh, injecting uh, opioids and uh, having uh, instances of overdose, 
Most things are pretty obvious and, and um, everybody knows there's a problem there. Many of our patients though have uh, been able to hide a pretty significant illness for, for years. And sometimes these symptoms can be a little bit more subtle, uh, especially as they, they build over time. And we know that, that addiction works that way, that we know that uh, chronic exposure uh, in, in any animals this can occur. So as we research this in uh, multiple animals, chronic exposure to these substances can lead to uh, a substance use disorder. But um, we know that these symptoms will build over time. So some of the more subtle signs that, that folks could look for are excessive use of opioids or using opioids uh, at times when it's not clear why they might need to have the opioid, maybe um, a just in case, as we say sometimes, uh, use of an opioid uh, rather than for specific pain, they're using it preemptively uh, to prevent maybe uh, some future uh, pain that they might anticipate, using it for reasons other than what it was prescribed for, right? So um, using to help manage emotions or, or when they're feeling stressed. Um, Changes in behavior are also some of the more subtle signs. So sometimes these folks can look very elated and it can be unclear why they're, they're so happy. And uh, then they'll go uh, within hours, sometimes multiple times a day, they'll go from being very excited to very sad or very miserable or very irritable. So it's that those mood swings or frequent mood swings to the extreme that can be a sign or more subtle sign. Um, there's also sometimes changes in sleep patterns that can be a bit more subtle uh, and uh, changes in priorities in their lives. They start prioritizing uh, their use of the opioid over, over everything else. Those are some of the more subtle things that uh, family yeah. members can see. That was really interesting to me what you said about um, priorities that uh, and I would think that would be a big uh, indicator that uh, perhaps the relationships that had been very important previously uh, right. don't appear to be so so um, prioritized or so important uh, because of a preoccupation with something else, uh, whatever that might be. Yeah, and, and hobbies too. They'll, folks will give up hobbies that they used to enjoy and um, be very much focused on and, and counting down the time in which, uh, or counting on the time to the next use or the next availability of the, of the opioid. Tyler, you mentioned something earlier that um, I thought was a very interesting. You stated that, you know, heroin, obviously the use of heroin is something that we all would recognize and hear and think, oh my goodness, that's, that's, a pretty severe issue that someone has. But I imagine there's a far gap between most patients who uh, eventually become heroin users and the way that they started uh, using opioids. Can you explain to us kind of what, I know all experiences are different, but what a common path might be? Yeah, so it is very individual for a lot of folks, but many folks begin their um, their use of opioids or their introduction with, uh, you know, uh, early early use of opioids when they're young, and and they identify that they maybe like it a little bit more than than uh, other folks. They, there's a feeling that they feel when they use those opioids, and it it may not take off then, but uh, as they're re-exposed and exposed again over time, uh, then they start seeking out those opioids. Sometimes what can happen is when they have a, a legitimate medical reason for opioids, they can get opioids for a long time. Um, and and those, those folks that are at risk can then um, struggle with giving up those opioids when it's time. And when their physician says it looks like it's time, uh, you know, to give up these opioids, we feel these opioids may be doing more harm than good. Um, and it's, it's time to let, let go of these. And they really struggle. There are certain folks that really struggle with that. Many folks do well uh, when they come off opioids, even if they've been on them for a long time, uh, when it's done in a safe, you know, medically assisted setting. But some folks really struggle with that. And when they're off those opioids and they don't have the help and support uh, of providers that can help them navigate that difficult time, they'll turn to illegal um, uh, means of getting opioids 
uh, like heroin off the streets or, or things like that. And that, that's a common pattern. That's, that's not the way everybody ends up um, uh, going uh, for illegal sources of, of opioids, but, but that's a well-known pattern. I've been fascinated by some of the uh, studies that have been published. I'm an anesthesiologist, obviously. I manage a lot of pain in patients in the hospital who have acute or, or reasons to have pain, such as they've had a surgery or an injury. And the studies have shown that there are a number of predictors of someone using opioids for a prolonged period of time after um, a situation like that. And it's the amount that, um, that is used during that period, how long they use opioids for, the duration of time is particularly important, the number of refills even that they get from uh, physicians. And so there are a number of indicators. And I always tell patients who um, may be concerned about opioid use disorder or who aren't, that uh, we don't really know who patients are at this point who may have difficulty with these substances, someday we probably will genetically uh, be able to predict that. But right now we use sort of universal precautions and we try to use the medications appropriately, but for um, the, the briefest periods of time that are possible uh, to, to manage uh, through a difficult situation of pain. Yeah, I think you're right. There's things we can control from the medical community and, and we try to do our best to control those things. And, and I think we've gotten better as a medical community uh, at controlling those things. And then there's things we can control, like some of the genetics and predisposition that folks uh, come into these situations with. Yeah, speaking of the things that we can control, we've done a concentrated, uh, huge amount of work uh, throughout uh, our Mayo Clinic uh, facilities in assessing how we prescribe opioids and trying to come up with evidence-based. That's what we like to say as uh, scientists and physicians, that there's a good reason for practicing the way that we practice. And we've been able to decrease our opioid prescribing very significantly, 50% in some areas, without any decrement in how satisfied patients are or how well their pain is controlled. So it just means we were giving out too many, too many opioids at times. And so I think that that had been really gratifying. However, I've now been seeing in the news that overdose rates are skyrocketing again, are really increasing during COVID-19. And I'm wondering, what are some of the, the factors associated with that? It can't just be that doctors are giving out more uh, opioids again. Oh, I, I, you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think, if anything, there's, there's less uh, physician interaction now than there was before. And I think, so I think it's multifactorial. I, I will, uh, the true causes and, and the reasons for all of this, I think, will become more clear over time. But we can... Um, we can make some educated uh, sort of guesses on, on what might be the cause of, of these overdoses. We know that uh, folks are under a significant amount of stress. Um, COVID-19 is it's a stressful time. Uh, individuals are out of work. Um, they're, they're dealing with, uh, you know, mass and social isolation. And so they're unable to get the, the, their normal uh, support network uh, up and running. So these, these types of stressors and isolation we know in addiction lead to more use of an addictive substance because the addictive substance becomes um, a bit of a coping strategy for folks. So um, in treatments, um, we try to get folks together. We try to get a community of folks to support each other in recovery. And that's been difficult during COVID-19 because groups are, are not really allowed. They're not really encouraged anyway. And so it's, diffi so it's difficult then to get a group of folks that are interested in staying uh, in recovery and wanting to support each other in recovery. There's been some interesting things that have been done virtually to, uh, to help support the, the self-help community. There's been a lot of work that we've done to support virtual uh, formal chemical dependency treatment. And those modalities work well. We know they work well. They can work as good as face-to-face -face appointments, but people are, are reluctant, I think, at times to try them. They're uh, put off a little bit by their first few interactions because it's new and it's difficult to socialize somewhat uh, virtually when you're just getting used to it. So those are some of the factors that we think are contributing to more use of addictive substances and more use of addictive substances leads to overdose. I would also say that we know that as folks are using more in isolation, 
they uh, are less likely to have somebody there that could provide a life-saving measure like a naloxone. And that leads to uh, more complex use or more dangerous use as well. Uh, Tyler, just the other day, I saw a very interesting a news story. You and I both practice medicine in Minnesota for Mayo Clinic. And there was a, a story out of the, one of the Twin Cities a news channels talking about how um, individuals were buying what they believed were legitimate oxycodone tablets, but that they were laced with fentanyl and they were really um, being made with a pill press like what a pill company or a, a pharmaceutical company would use, but they were not legitimate. Could you just briefly address what is it about fentanyl and why are we hearing so much about fentanyl related to overdoses? Yeah, fentanyl is a high potency opioid and it is, it, it's an opioid that folks, when they take it, are at high risk for overdose because they may not be uh, ready or they may not uh, have the tolerance for that level of potency. It is um, apparently becoming very cheap. This was a problem even before uh, COVID-19 that we were seeing fentanyl become more and more common. People can, um, uh, dealers can use a small amount of fentanyl and get the same effect as a similar or as a larger amount of heroin. So there's um, some um, cost savings associated with using it um, and selling it. And so it's become more and more popular, but it's incredibly dangerous because individuals who think they're buying, as you said, uh, oxycodone, that's something they're, they're familiar with and had used before, maybe in a medical setting, all of a sudden get fentanyl, which is significantly more potent. Um, that, that certainly can cause an overdose and certainly can, can kill them. Um, yeah, as an anesthesiologist with a procedural practice, I do a lot of interventional procedures for pain. Uh, as do my colleagues here, we use a lot of fentanyl for sedation. It's a very commonly used medication mm -hmm. because it has a very rapid acting effect, but it also uh, wears off very rapidly. So when the procedure is done, the patient um, is wakeful, but it is an incredibly uh, potent drug. About a, We think of it as about 100 times more potent than morphine. Yeah. So when, as you said, individuals aren't accustomed to um, a drugs that potent, then the risk of overdose is high and it's manufactured and it's being made very cheaply, um, particularly in places in the Middle East and in China and brought into the United States. And so there is yeah. more and more of it mixed in our drug supply, which is an increasing concern for the DEA, I know. Yeah, it's, yeah, very dangerous. Big topic right now. Well, uh, Tyler, let's move on to what um, treatment options there are for patients who are suffering from opioid use disorder. Where do you start? Yeah, so the classic treatment option are group-based therapies where folks come together, as I mentioned before, they come together and they work on strategies and um, work on support to help them maintain sobriety and get into what we call recovery, which is a, a state in which they're actively kind of managing the illness and, and treating the illness on a, on a regular basis and um, that the illness isn't active in their life that they're not using. These, these types of chemical dependency treatment programs have been around for a long time and that approach has been around for a long time and been very effective, but we know that there's a lot of folks that, uh, in, that, that don't get enough out of that in order to maintain sobriety. There's a large physical component to these addictions and we know medicines can help uh, with that uh, physical component. And so there's, three uh, very good FDA approved medication options to treat opioid use disorder as well. And we typically recommend that folks consider doing both, that they do the uh, psychological interventions along with the medical interventions. So the medicines, just to mention those, those, those would be methadone um, administered as part of a methadone treatment program uh, or buprenorphine, uh, more commonly known as Suboxone. And then naltrexone would be the third one, which is more commonly administered in a long-acting injectable form, which individuals get once a month. What's interesting, Tyler, is that two of the medications that you mentioned, um, methadone and buprenorphine, which is the primary substance in the brand name drug Suboxone, are opioids. And so here we are taking patients who have an opioid use disorder 
and treating them with opioids. Now that may seem contradictory to some of your patients and even some of our listeners. How do you respond to that? Right, uh, thank you for that question. That, that's a common one that we get from, from family and, and friends that um, are you know, surprised that we would make this, this recommendation to their loved one. We, uh, we know that these medications work differently than other opioids and they have some specific properties associated with them that make them ideal uh, as part of a comprehensive treatment program to treat folks with opioid use disorder. So methadone, for example, is very long acting. And if it's administered once a day, it covers the opioid receptor and really diminishes opioid use disorder symptoms throughout the day. So individuals can go about their life, they can, they can work, they can be active in their family or active in, with their family and, and in their community. They can, they can do healthy and, and um, recovery oriented things. And it can be done once a day and, and individuals can go in and, and get that medication at a, at a methadone clinic and then go about their day. Buprenorphine is a medication that has uh, a, is longer acting, so it does last a long time and can be administered once a day. It also has an interesting property in which it, it only partially activates the opioid receptor. So it's a very safe opioid. And it's very difficult to overdose on that medication because of the way it interacts with some of these opioid receptors in the brain. And because that medication is a bit more safe, it can be uh, given in an office setting. So it can be prescribed by a uh, clinician that has a, a, a certain uh, certification. And, and it's uh, very effective, can be as effective as methadone uh, in, in the right doses. So those uh, are very good options and, and when administered appropriately are very safe and uh, can help folks enter what we call long-term sustained recovery, which is their uh, illnesses being very well managed and uh, having uh, very few signs or symptoms of that illness. And Suboxone has been so prevalent in the news in the last few years um, the DEA has been trying to um, expand the number of providers who could help patients with medically assisted therapy. And so uh, the, one of the, the unique properties about buprenorphine, although it's an opioid, are that because it acts differently than some of the other traditional opioids that we would think of, like oxycodone, for instance, it not only lacks some of the really uh, positive properties that would cause patients to seek out an opioid and to abuse it potentially, uh, because it's not as habituating or as reinforcing, but it also lacks some of the terrible side effects that we associate with opioids, such as um, as severe risk for respiratory depression, for instance. Yeah, that's very true. It has uh, advantages across the board. It's it's much less addictive, much less abusable, uh, I should say, and um, and much less side effects. It's a, it's a really helpful medication for a lot of folks and doesn't require the same degree of, uh, of going to a, a methadone clinic every day uh, that uh, can be sometimes um, a uh, difficult thing for folks to do. You and I have focused today on opioid use disorder, but I have to believe that the use of other substances is increasing as well, uh, perhaps with potential for abuse. I've seen that the sales of alcohol are uh, much higher than they have been previously, probably for multiple reasons. But is there concern for the misuse of other uh, substances during COVID-19 uh, as well as opioids? Definitely. So the, the same reasons folks have been overusing opioids, uh, are, those are the same reasons why folks would overuse other addictive substances, that they're under a lot of stress, they're um, in a very challenging, uh, isolated situation, and they'll turn to things that they've used before uh, as a bit of a coping strategy. We know these are unhealthy coping strategies that lead to a lot of problems and a lot of uh, unhappiness, but uh, individuals will turn to those. And alcohol is a great example. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot more need for treatment. And unfortunately, it's also at a time when uh, treatment is more limited because of uh, the, the need to keep inpatient units relatively small to, to help with isolation and 
a lot of new procedures from infectious disease. So we know most programs in our state uh, are uh, diminished capacity because of COVID-19 restrictions. So at a time when there's more need for treatment, we have less beds or less capacity and it's it's been a challenge, but we do have uh, very good treatment options. Uh, we do feel that the, a lot of the virtual options that we've uh, gotten up and running and um, been able to uh, implement pretty broadly across the state have been very helpful for folks. Tyler, my last question for you today is a bit of a practical one. If I'm a listener and I'm worried that um, a loved one or someone that I know is suffering from uh, substance use disorder um, and that it's perhaps even worsening during COVID, what can I do to help? I, I think it's definitely important to talk to the individual, uh, to let them know your concerns and be very specific about the things you're seeing. Uh, there are some uh, signs that we talked about today. Uh, can go to our, our Mayo Clinic website as more information about this as well, um, about some of the signs that individuals can see uh, with, um, with substance use disorders. Let them know, talk to them, let them know your concerns, be open and honest to them uh, about uh, what you're seeing and let them know that there are good options and that these options are available to anybody. And um, the, the, there's people waiting and, and able to help. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today, Tyler. Definitely, happy to be here, appreciate the opportunity. Our thanks to Dr. Tyler Osterley, who is a psychiatrist and addiction medicine specialist at the Mayo Clinic. I hope that you've learned some useful information today. Uh, if anything, we want to bring you hope today for you or for your loved ones. And we wish you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well.